Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video and in this section of the notes, we're going to be covering a summary of the inferential statistics techniques and which calculator programs, apps, and, and programs go with them. And uh, this is kind of a summary overall of the techniques that we're doing in this semester, in this, uh, this unit. Okay, and it will help us decide what we're going to do. So there are two main parts of inferential statistics that we've been studying. That's a hypothesis test and a confidence interval. Let's talk about hypothesis tests first. Hypothesis tests come in uh, two parts, a one or two sample version. Uh, the one sample version, what we're doing is, is testing a sample statistic, such as uh, sample mean, sample proportion, or sample standard deviation, X bar, P hat, or S, against a hypothesized known corresponding population parameter, uh, mu, P naught, or sigma, that is the population mean, proportion, or, or standard deviation. The two sample version, what we do is we test two sample statistics from independent samples against each other. So we're comparing, uh, uh, say, an X bar 1 to an X bar 2 or a P hat 1 to a P hat 2. Uh, each of these tests has sort of three varieties, a left, right, or two-tailed test. Uh, a left-tailed test tests to see if the sample statistic is significantly lower than the hypothesized parameter or if the first sample statistic is significantly lower than the sample, second sample statistic in the in the two sample version. Right tailed tests are sort of just the opposite. That we want to test to see if the sample statistic is significantly higher than the hypothesized parameter, or if the first sample statistic is significantly higher than the second sample statistic. Two tailed tests just to test to see if the sample statistic is significantly higher or lower, just different than. So the two-tailed test tests to see if the sample statistic is significantly different than, either higher or lower than the hypothesized parameter, or if the first sample statistic is significantly different than the second sample statistic. So one of the things that you have to do when you're deciding what to do on hypothesis test is you know, decide if it's a one or two sample decide if it's left, right, or two-tailed. So you're going to be looking for keywords like uh, less than or show that something is smaller than or that their claim was inflated. That's going to be a left-tailed test. A right-tailed test is, is sort of just the opposite of that. You're going to be looking for showing that something is bigger than hypothesized. Something is more than. Two-tailed tests look for something about just being different, not necessarily higher or lower, but just different. So you need to look for those key words in the, uh, in the problem, which will be given to you in a little sentence or two, a little paragraph. Uh, remember that if you have a paired data that it's really not two samples, it's really one sample. Uh, and so what you do is you find the difference of the two in the, of the pairs and then do a one sample techniques with that. We always have a null and alternative hypothesis, uh, hypotheses, one each for the uh, uh, hypothesis testing. The null hypothesis is the assumed status quo assumption. It includes really then assuming that the distribution of test statistics has some known distribution with a given population parameter. This allows us to use it to compute probabilities, p-values, and inverse probabilities, critical values. The alternative hypothesis is what we're trying to prove. So we never prove the null hypothesis. We try to prove the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis will always be stated with an equal to statement like mu equals a certain number or p p or p naught equals a certain number whereas the alternative hypothesis might be stated with a less than for a left tailed test a greater than with a right tailed test or just a not equal to for a two tailed test there are two main ways of doing a hypothesis tests 
We can look at the critical values or p-values. Critical values are found by doing inverse probability calculations, assuming the null hypothesis is true, so that the probability of something there or more extreme is alpha. In a left-tailed test, the probability to the left of the critical value is alpha. To the right of the critical value is alpha in a right-tailed test. In a two-tailed test, alpha over 2 is the probability getting less than the lower critical value, and alpha over 2 is also the probability of getting greater than the upper critical value. We reject the null hypothesis when the test statistic is in the critical region, more extreme than the critical values, higher than the upper critical value or lower than the lower critical value. A p-value approach, which I actually prefer, is, uh, is computing a probability. So the p-value is the probability of getting a sample statistic at or more extreme than the one we actually got, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. That sentence is probably the most important sentence in the entire course. Making sure that you understand what a p-value is is extremely important. The p-value is the probability of making a type 1 error if we rejected only test statistics at or more extreme than the one we have. Alpha is the maximum probability of type 1 error that we will accept. We reject the null hypothesis when p is less than alpha. If p is greater than or equal to alpha, then we fail to reject. So the uh, p-value approach has the advantage of uh, if you report the p-value, then someone who has a different alpha value doesn't have to do any more computations. All they have to do is to compare that p-value to their choice of alpha. And so that's one of the value, of values of it. Also, the size of the p-value gives you some measure of the level of certainty we are in making our decision. Uh, but there are two types of errors we could make with hypothesis tests. A type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. This has probability alpha, and hypothesis tests are designed to control the size of alpha. Typically, we want alpha to be something small. Usual suspects are 10%, uh, 5%, or 1%. That is uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. But those are not the only possibilities. We could choose whatever we want for alpha, actually. Failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false is called a type 2 error. It has a probability we call beta. 1 minus beta is called the power of the test. All right, let's talk just a little bit about confidence intervals in general. They also come in a one sample and two sample version. The one sample version produces an interval of values, which we hope includes the unknown population parameter. Population parameter might be population mean, mu, the population proportion of successes, p sub zero, or the population standard deviation, sigma. The interval will contain the sample statistics uh, of the point estimators. So that is, you know, x bar, p hat or s. In the case of x bar and p hat, uh, they're exactly at the midpoint of the interval. That may not be true for s. A two sample confidence interval produces an interval of values which we hope includes the difference in the unknown population parameters from the two populations. So for example, a uh, two sample test or confidence interval for uh, means would would be a, um, an interval for mu1 minus mu2, which are the two population means for the two populations that the two samples were uh, chosen from. A confidence interval, a confidence level for a confidence interval, sometimes I abbreviate that CL, is 1 minus alpha. That's the probability that the confidence interval includes the target population parameter. Remember that the population parameter is actually fixed unknown value. With different samples of the same size and margin of error, the confidence level is the proportion or percentage of them which will capture the population parameter. It's the intervals that are moving around 
which will end up all having the same width if we keep the margin of error and the sample size the same. But they will um, perhaps not all include the true population parameter, but they will do that one minus alpha of the time. It's very important to try to use confidence intervals and hypothesis tests together to get a stronger description of the situation. Either one of them by themselves uh, may not be quite as strong as putting them together, particularly when we end up rejecting the null hypothesis. So what's the basic process for going through inferential statistics? The first thing we have to do is define and determine what type of test or interval that we need. Are we computing a hypothesis test or a confidence interval or both? Are we performing inferences about means, proportions, or standard deviations? Is it a one or two sample test or interval? Is the hypothesis test left, right, or two-tailed? So these are kind of the decisions we have to make to decide which one of these we need to use. Now all of these uh, things that we use, actually anywhere in mathematics, if you want to use a theorem or anything, you have to decide uh, and determine and, and verify that the hypothesis of that uh, theorem is, is uh, valid. Now, if you're going to, in other words, if you're going to apply some technique, you got to make sure that that technique actually is appropriate and works. So we have to verify the conditions are met for the chosen statistical hypothesis test or confidence interval. All the conditions must be verified before we perform the inference. For example, some of these require that the distribution of individuals is normal. You have to check that first, say with a normal probability plot. Others require just that the distribution of sample statistics is normal. And we have some conditions where that could be true. Now, in our case, once this decision has been made, we have calculator apps built into the TI calculators or programs that I've written for the TI-84, which allow this uh, process from this point to be completely automated. Um, so every type that we've studied in this particular unit, uh, in this, in this uh, slideshow and in this set of notes, uh, every single one, we have a calculator shortcut app or program. The ones that weren't built in the TI-84, I wrote programs for. Now, pull up the appropriate one based on what you've done further earlier, and then enter your data or statistics. So if it's if you have an actual data set, you'll go to stat, edit, and type that in L1 on the TI-84 or in a column on a spreadsheet on a TI-Inspire. And then you work from there. If you already have the summary statistics, computed for the data set and you don't have the actual data set, then go to uh, choose statistics. Match the numbers in the problem to the right parts of the program or app. Enter the right pieces together. Then the calculator does the work and uh, there's no need to memorize the formulas it's using and so forth to get the results because the calculator will produce that. Then what you have to do is, is know how to interpret the results. See what the calculator output means. And finally, what you're going to do is write down the conclusion. It's probably going to be a few sentences, probably more than one, two or three sentences usually. And there, your statements should include the sample size, the sample statistics, a p-value, an alpha value, confidence level, type of test or interval, conclusion, and interpret the whole thing in the context of the problem. All right, now one of the most important parts here is we're going to now re review a decision um, chart here for deciding which inference we need to do. So if we're doing inferences about means, sample means are approximately normal. Uh, if we have that, then we can proceed with the types of uh, uh, inferences that we did in this unit. If that's not true, and it very well could not be true, then we have to use some other type of test, something called a non-parametric test, and there are a few of those out there, like a uh, uh, Wil Wilcoxon test or a Mann-Whitney test. And there's some different types of tests out there that you can look at. 
So if the population standard deviation is known and our sample means are approximately normal, then we're talking about using a standard normal distribution for our, for our uh, probability values, inverse probability values. So this would be a confidence interval. We would be doing a Z interval app on the calculator, the one that's built in. And if it's a one sample hypothesis test, that's a Z test app. That's, those are for one sample. If it's paired data, uh, and we're doing a hypothesis test. Remember, we're going to use the differences, and that would be the z-test app or the z-interval for a, a confidence interval. If it's two samples, two independent samples, the hypothesis test and interval are found using the two-sample z-test and the two-sample z-interval apps. Now, it's actually very rare that we really actually know the population standard deviation. So a much more uh, realistic situation and much more useful and, and more more often uh, needed section is where we're using T distributions for our probabilities and inverse probabilities. So this is a population standard deviation unknown when the sample means are approximately normal. Use a confidence interval by the T interval app on the calculator and a one sample hypothesis test is the t-test app. Again, if we have paired data uh, for a hypothesis test, use the differences and just use it as a single um, uh, sample using a t-test for the uh, hypothesis test and a t-interval for the confidence interval. But a two sample uh, situation where we're testing uh, means uh, where the sample means are approximately normal and the standard deviation is unknown for the population, do a two-sample hypothesis test and interval will be the two-sample t-test and the two-sample t-interval apps which are built in the calculator. Testing means is probably the most common thing, but testing proportions is a close second. Inferences about proportions. If it's a one-sample hypothesis test, the the, the best way to get the actual correct values is to run by program one purport. This is a one proportion um, inference program. It will do a, a appropriate uh, p-value. So if it's if the sample size, if the population size is known, it will do it will use hypergeometric distribution and find an actual p-value. If the population size is very large, but it um, is unknown, then we then the same program will switch over to the binomial distribution and do the probabilities from that. And it will also give you uh, what the calculator would do for a uh, one proportion Z test, which I do not have listed here. Uh, because it's really not what you should be using, but it will give you that, which is a normal approximation. For that to be good, uh, both NP and NQ have to be large, greater than 30, let's say. And then it's an approximation. The binomial is a better approximation. The hypergeometric is correct if you, can, if you have the information to use it. Now, for a confidence interval, if the population and sample sizes are large, we can use the one proportion Z interval. Okay, and so what we're doing there is we're using a normal approximation of a binomial and, a, and hypergeometric situation. So my, my rules are that NP and NQ both need to be greater than 30 to use this. Some statisticians use less stringent uh, criteria there. A two sample hypothesis test is used if the po and the population and sample sizes are large, we can use a two proportion Z test app built into the calculator. And a two sample confidence interval, again, the population sa and sample sizes both need to be large for this, is a two proportion Z interval app. app. Um, so those are, uh, if I give you one in my class, it will be, I'll guarantee the population and sample size is going to be very large so that these are appropriate for uh, for the two proportion z test, two proportion z interval. Finally, we can also do some inferences about standard deviations. Those aren't done as often 
as the inference is about means and proportions, but they still are used. And so if we're trying to test the variability of something, not rather the center or the proportion of successes, we're talking about inferences about standard deviations. So a one sample confidence interval and hypothesis test, if the individuals are normal, is found by using my SD test program. It does both the hypothesis test and the confidence interval. So it will test you, take you through that. So for that standard deviation test program. Notice that this one does require that the individuals are normal, not just the distribution of sample means are normal. So you're almost always going to have to do a, a normal probability plot before you pull up and run the SD test program. Once you've decided that the normal probability plot tells us that the data is more or less normal. A two sample hypothesis test, if the individuals are normal, uses an F distribution. There is a built in app for that, it's called the F test app. The SD test is using a chi square distribution. The chi square pro app that's built in your calculator is for something else that also uses that same distribution. A two sample confidence interval, if the individuals are normal, once we've done a normal probability plot to determine that, then we can run our program, F interval program. So you see that uh, on these two pages, this one here and the one before here, you have enough information here to decide which calculator program you need to use. Once you do that, it's pretty easy to plug in the numbers, interpret your output. So come back for some review and practice problems using these. Uh, shortcuts.